We are Yats. Um, I'm a 10th grade student. My name is Dylan. Let's see. Um, we're here to tell you about great expectations and what that means for you, how you can bring that back to your schools, and um, a couple of notes I want to make. If you have any questions throughout the day, feel free to ask them, um, or ask, so find somebody with one of these shirts afterwards to ask a question if you don't feel comfortable. Um, My name is Audrey. I'm from Hazen. My name is Leanne. I'm from Hazen. And I'm Helen Beatty. I'm director of YAST. Um, and also want to introduce Aaron Bazell. He is the assistant director of YAST. Part of, of the story of you and you being here today is that a ton of people in this state, in this country, can't even imagine that you're going to be playing the roles that you're going to be playing when you go back at school. So part of our work is to help them see what it looks like when you're given um, tools and take on responsibility to play significant roles back in, in your schools. Um, so our hopes for you guys is by the end of the day that you guys will kind of be an expert on um, expectations for your school. Today you're going to see a video of a boy who has just learned to ride his bike. And it truly captures what great expectations means and what it means to be excited about learning. I feel... Do you feel alive? I feel, I feel, I feel happy of myself. I feel happy of myself too. What do you have any words of wisdom? What about for all the other kids trying to learn how to ride their bike? Can you say anything to them? Everybody, I know you can believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, you will know how to ride a bike. If you don't, you just keep practicing. You will get the hang of it, I know it. If you if you keep practicing, you will keep, get the hang of it. And then you can get better and better at it if you get it, if you do it. Give me some thumbs up. Thumbs up, everybody! All right. For rock and roll! <laughs> now I'd just like you to take a minute and find a partner and talk about a time when you felt like just like this little boy did. Remember when I won my first tournament when I was really young? Oh, yeah. hard like the first song was but like the second song I went on did it all and we got off and everybody was proud of every all of us. By the end of today you will know why expectations matter. We will talk we will say ex the word expectations many times today and I think today will give you a very good explanation of what that is. We're gonna have a few slides just about um, what you're gonna be doing today what we hope that you will know by the end of today. We're going to talk about like the connection between expectations and your brain, so by the end of the day you'll know more about the connection between expectations and how your brain works. The remote control just shows how you'll be in more control of your learning, and you'll help others do the same. We'll spend a chunk of time on something called mindset, and, and a way that gives all of us um, sort of control over framing um, how we believe in our potential as individuals. and and is really pretty amazing in terms of shifting uh, us to be able to be our fullest selves. So, really powerful tool. So today, you will leave with a so-called toolkit of materials that you can use in um, whatever you feel necessary that, um, is gonna, that you can do in your school. And so inside your folder, you'll have activities and um, many different things that you can do and you can utilize in your own schools. So after today, you guys will be able to return back to your school, and you guys will be like us. <laughs> and that's like within a month, that you will be leading trainings or events at school. So literally, a pretty quick turnaround for you being Dylan, Audrey, or Leanne. No pressure. <laughs> so our, 
um, yes to my Hazen last year, worked on Great Expectations, and we went into every 10th grade classroom and led some classes. And so, as you watch this clip, I'd just like you to visualize yourself as the leader speaking. Some people, it might make them want to do better, try harder, so that next time... Pretty good at this, they... right? So now, now that everybody has um, put their things together, um, it's important that you talk about, um, if you feel comfortable in your group, you don't have to, um, decide where you think you might be at this point. Um, and kind of just share with the group, and if you feel, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's fine too, but it's encouraged that you do. It would be the growth mindset decision that you share. <laughs> a couple of other things that we've tried in the past and been successful at are or to organize an assembly. That can be for faculty or whoever you um, want to project towards. We had a faculty meeting where <coughs> you could um, get the fact faculty on board with um, the work you want to do and host a dialogue night for parents. And so this is kind of a community thing. It's youth and adults transforming schools together. So um, it involves the adults uh, such as the teachers, um, administration, the students, and even parents and other community members. So with each activity we do today, we want you to experience it firsthand. So you'll be doing an activity and also while you're doing it, we'd be asking you to think about is this an activity that I like enough, I connect with enough, to want to do it back at home? So you're kind of in both worlds, both participant, but you're a critical consumer saying, this was okay, but, but I don't think I can imagine myself or my group using it in my school, or this is absolutely an activity that I, I connected to, and usually when you as a facilitator connect to it, then you can bring it out with tons of good energies. Another way to think about this is today is like a buffet meal for you. And you're, you know, this this gorgeous buffet. Um, you're tasting different pieces of the offerings. Um, some of them you, you put aside and say thanks, but I don't think so. And then you choose which ones you're going to be bringing back to students, to faculty, to parents in your schools. Talk to the person next to you about what excites you about that and what makes you fearful about that. I haven't had anything, but doubles when it's actually and I'm not good at but it's still like it was it was I think it would be fun to be like, you know, that will be new and different. What do you think they think? I think they think it's like a good part of the we're going to uh, just get anybody's thoughts about what excites you first about the work that you're venturing into here. We're excited to actually be doing something because we haven't done much in our school for a long time. Great. Right. Right. Well, I'm kind of excited to try something new because we've been doing a lot of the same like activities at our school and we don't really know if they're making a difference. So I really want to go in and try something new and see if that really gets into people. And I think these kinds of things are often um, shared among faculty or we get to talk about them and really it's the students who need to know and be part of and um, be practicing these kinds of things. So I'm really excited that they're here to do it. And so seldom that you as middle school students get to be the messengers. I mean, that's, and there's an incredible power with that. Um, so we are all here, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge which schools are here. From afar, from Newark, um, a warm welcome. We have Northfield, first to come through our doors um, at 8.30 this morning. So. Hardwood. We have Twinfield. We have Williston. Welcome. We have Hazen Union, another veteran at school. Welcome. So, ground rules are only important today to be successful, but when you go home, you're going to want to some as well. So as we read them, I would just like to see your thumbs up if you understand and can live with these rules, aside if you need more information and if you cannot live with these rules. One person speaks at a time. <laughs> Everyone listens while that person is talking with an open mind, mutual respect, and an acceptance of differing opinions. Everyone who wants to talk will get a chance to speak. 
You may pass at any time if you don't wish to speak. It's your right. Cut-ups gladly accepted. No put-downs of self or others. Focus on issues, not people. So this is a very difficult one for some people to understand. Um, if, if there's an issue that is brought up, there's talking about your school and maybe in some sort of specific instance that happened, uh, we try to ask you to not use names or get frustrated about it, but just listen, keep an open mind. It lets you talk about issues, but not tag people. We want you guys to respect each other's confidentiality. Um, and by confidentiality, we mean um, with that when you have stories shared to you, Please don't share them with other people unless you have permission to share those stories. Try to stay on subject. We've got a full day. Um, time for you to have mingling time. But when we're focused on sharing these tools with you, just ask you to stay focused. Be honest with yourself and others. Perhaps the most important thing a facilitator does is keep things safe and create that safety. So, yeah, just think about how you're going to do this back at home. Um, but the thumbs up for today works. Uh, it looked like there was consensus. And when everybody does this, nobody's taking for granted that people are agreeing. And it wasn't so important that we look and see thumbs are up, but that you look and see thumbs are up. You have a sense. In your group, everybody's committing to this. So some way that you can be assured and make everybody else know that this is a safe place. Research, and, and in fact over 52,000 studies were sort of looked at about what, what makes learning good, um, what makes a classroom feel really energized, a place you want to be during the day. The study that's cited most frequently is in a middle school. The, the best predictor of how well students do is their assessment of how successful they're going to be, their own self-expectations. So when we do something about this topic, we're hitting the most important thing we can hit to influence, in a positive way, our school environment. It's really clear your work will make an impact when we start to focus on this topic. A little bit of background. The original study that made the case that teachers' expectations of students will define how well students do. So how much your teacher believes in your capacity as a student, as a learner, has a huge influence on how well a student does, more so than on any conscious level for the student or the teacher. We're going to share for you a story of this Pygmalion effect, that, that this cycle of what adults believe about you creates a reality, and then that gets reinforced. I'm going to ask you to be looking for four things that they found were very different in the way a teacher treated a student they believed was, was bright and, and was, had great learning potential, in the way teachers responded to students that they didn't believe had as much learning potential. In this movie, you're going to see a climate issue you're going to see that there's a difference in the climate that the teacher sets between students of assumed high or lesser ability. You're going to see something about how input, how much is taught, what happens to the, the amount of information a student gets based on that assumption. You're going to see a difference about how a teacher responds to students, depending on their assessment of the, the student's capacity. And you're going to hear about how the teacher um, gives feedback to students that's different. It's this thing called Human Highlighters, where we're going to choose, uh, ask for four volunteers, hopefully from different schools, just to mix it up. So they're going to focus on one of these things personally, because it's, sometimes it's hard to follow everything. So if, if we have one person for each, we can clearly get a better understanding of all of them. And just so you know, before you volunteer, you are allowed a lifeline. So if you find yourself up here and you didn't really find what you were looking for, you can call on a friend from the audience.
Can I have four volunteers? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to give you a highlighter. And you will focus on one of the uh, specific other four things we talked about. So okay. get your feedback. Or... Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Positive expectations can change a person's perception of a situation just as dramatically as negative expectations. Psychologists call this the Pygmalion effect after the George Bernard Shaw play of the same name in which even an uneducated ragamuffin can be transformed into a proper society lady. In an experiment conducted at an elementary school like this one, psychologist Robert Rosenthal and school principal Lenore Jacobson took the Pygmalion effect one step further. What we wanted to show was the extent to which teachers' expectations could actually affect pupils' intellectual performance, for example, their IQ scores. So what we did was we tested everybody in a school with a test that pretended to be a test that would predict academic blooming, so-called Harvard test of inflected acquisition, and allegedly on the basis of that test but not really we gave each of the teachers in the school the names of a handful of children in her classroom that would get smart in the academic year ahead these kids names were taken out of a hat we we chose them by means of a table of random numbers the children themselves did not know in any direct way that uh, teachers were holding certain expectations for them teachers were told not to tell the kids and of course, we didn't tell the, the children either. So the children never knew. And then when we tested the children a year later, we found that those kids who'd been alleged to their teachers to be showing or going to show intellectual gains, in fact, showed greater intellectual gains than did the children of whom we'd said nothing in particular. So the kids actually got smarter when they were expected to get smarter by their teachers. Uh, we've come to feel that they're really before we do this activity on the pink sheet, um, we're going to call on our human highlighters. Um, first one, the climate. What did you notice? All right, so when a teacher gave a student a warmer climate, they were nice to them, as in, like, just smiled at them in the hallway, which could eventually help the student learn better with that certain teacher. Thank you. Okay, the input. The teacher taught more to the kids that they felt were going to do well, and the kids that like, thought they didn't get to do well, they like, didn't give them like, that extra material, that extra time. It was just like, you're going to do well, so you need to know this. And the kids that weren't going to do well, they just like, didn't do that all the time. Opportunities to respond. I noticed that students that the teachers believed had more like, um, potential and stuff, uh, they gave them more opportunities you know, to respond, which you know, would create, um, would let them you know, learn more. Thank you. And teacher feedback. Um, teacher feedback is like, I noticed that they had kids more involved. Like, they were helping them along by giving them feedback on what they were doing right and just really enhancing that, oh, you did really well on this. And that kind of raised the kids' cool. Thank energy. You. Yeah. Round of applause for the human yeah. You direct your attention at the pink sheet, and after all you've heard about um, these, um, this vermilion effect in the four topics, just jot down some ideas that you have. The next thing I'm going to do is you're going to do sort of what we call a mini hurricane. Is you're going to move around at your table and mix up, and so you're going to, and then like once you find a new seat at your table, talk to somebody else that you haven't talked to. Um, about what you wrote for your um, low expectations and high expectations on the lower part of that pink sheet. So get up and find a different place at the table. For the students that they gave high expectations to, that they were generally nicer to them and they gave them more opportunities. Okay, so to sum up a little bit about what we've been doing, um, we have a little slide that says, Why do teachers and parents' expectations matter? Researchers say that self-expectations are the strongest predictor of a person's academic success. 
if we can raise expectations in our school, we are doing something significant. And again, we have the pyramid, the expectations at the top, I think it's most important. When adults have high expectations for students, students live up to them. When adults have low expectations or give up on students, students give up on themselves. Occasionally there are exceptions. There are people who have been given this message of low expectations and they just hammer. <laughs> and so this video actually is pretty cool, um, I think, of some people who were given that message that they weren't going to succeed and then they succeeded in spades. So see what you think. Dismissed from drama school with a note that read, wasting her time, she's too shy to put her best foot forward. Turned down by the Decca recording company who said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. A failed soldier, farmer, and real estate agent. At 38 years old, he went to work for his father as a handyman. Cut from the high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. The teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything and he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Fired from a newspaper because he lacked imagination and had no original ideas. His fiance died, he failed in business twice, he had a nervous breakdown and he was defeated in eight elections. If you've never failed, you've never lived. Just a couple of points to close this piece about why we think expectations matter so much. One really important point I want to make is that when teachers are in this place of this self-fulfilling prophecy, when they're making um, sometimes assumptions, they're not doing it intentionally in most instances. It's part of our society. It's the way our schools have been shaped. It's the way media shapes messages. And it's not something that anybody wishes to be perpetuating. Our teachers care deeply about students and want to do the best by them that they possibly can. But yet we know that unless we get really intentional about this, unless we ask all of us to think deeply about it, we will keep doing the same old thing. That's just the way it is. So assuming best intentions, knowing that teachers care deeply, but knowing that we can be a messenger to say, what little part of you lives with any of this? What part of me lives with believing messages? And then making it seem like they're real. That's what this work is about. And the other piece I would just reinforce is, and we're going to do a lot more on this today, is that a lot of the reasons why people might be thinking that they should have lower expectations for somebody are totally false. <laughs> and so you see that. Michael Jordan cried and didn't make his basketball team. I mean, the number of people who have been thought to not have potential and then prove it wrong highlight the fact that within each of us is greatness. Within each of us is potential. Um, and that's another part of what we'll be exploring more today. I'd like you to take out your agenda, pink on the left side of your shoulders. And once you have that out, I'd just like you to look at the activities we've done. There should be a list. And next to that is the first box says, what did you learn? What, yeah. what stuck for you? And be honest, like say whatever you think. In the second box, um, how would you use this back at your school? And how would you change it to make it better for your needs? Again, please be honest because it helps us a lot. Okay, so now I'd like you to be to share at your table something what you learned if you're comfortable with that. The table, I'll give you a few minutes. But how do you think those guys, like you know, Michael Jordan, the ones you just showed, how do you think they all achieved that? Like, because like, I guess it's really negative kind of messages. So they pick themselves back up. And, uh, um, there has to be some, like, somebody else that would be in there. Yeah. So now I'd ask that maybe one person from each table share out if they're comfortable, something that they learned or would like to say. I learned about the Pygmalion effect. 
I never knew <coughs> anything about that, so. Okay. Teachers need to have high expectations for kids to succeed. Having expectations for yourself will help you succeed. I just ask that you give me a one being not so much and a five being great that you would use this Pygmalion type video at your school. So did the whole activity, did it? And it would be predominantly the teachers that she would be more about to buy in. Okay, thank you. So uh, I know it's been a busy morning, so we're going to have a, a short about 10 minute break. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, Shuffle into the back into the building after that fine energizer. Find somebody that you don't know from a different school, maybe, and talk about what you learned this morning. I learned. I can see that. So what did you learn this morning? Learn why expectations matter. And so we're going to kind of move on to our next major subject for today. is what's the relationship between expectations and how the brain learns. It's more than just theory that expectations matter. The more that you can understand recent brain research, how the brain learns, and the effect of expectations on learning, uh, the more effective you're going to be as messengers back at home. Everything that we're doing is in this manual. And you actually have the, um, the PowerPoint, and you'll have access to this PowerPoint to reuse and do however you want as you train. But let's go to page 27, actually. It's called the Information Processing Model. A couple years ago, I went to a Learning in the Brain Research Conference at Harvard. Um, and there was this person, Dr. David Sousa, who consults a lot nationally. And what I loved about his work is that it's really visual. So this is his model as a neuropsychologist and educator of how our brain processes information. I'm going to really briefly review this, because then in a couple minutes, you'll see Twinfield students making this real through a play just to give you triggers for what you'll be looking for in the video. So by his theory, we have information that comes in through all of our senses. And there's this sensory register. You'll see it as a Venetian blind, um, like on these back windows that open or close. So you'll see information hit this sensory register. And the sensory register is either going to like it and let it in, or close it. And I'd ask you to look for why the register closes down. If it gets through, it gets into our memories. Our immediate, this, she's kind of a hoop. Watch for the immediate memory. It's really frantic. And the working memory, where it, we really start to chew on information that we're learning. And then some of that is able to earn its way into long-term storage. You'll see a big vault. You'll see somebody with a, a, a graduation garment on. He's long-term storage. But he'll be explaining why does information, what, what makes information that we've been working on actually get space in long-term storage? Because we slough a lot of it out. We throw a lot of it away because we haven't for a number of reasons. So you'll be learning about that. What I loved about this model and why it connects so to great expectations is this, the role of self-concept. And what happens when self-concept doesn't believe you can learn? What happens to the Venetian blind? Just so you know, the script for the play is available, not in this packet, but online. And are, so too are the props. I can't see me loving nobody but you for all my life. I can't believe it's 9.30 already. Physics test is tomorrow. 
Maybe my teacher was joking. I'm gonna be up cramming for this all night. What do I know about physics? Test. No, it's time for your brain workout. What kind of flabby, you know? Yeah, you should have been exercising us all semester, but I think you've been a little lazy. Who are you guys? And how did you get in here? Sam, what are your brain? What's up, Sam? I start getting us, your brain, in shape. The more you use us, the smarter you'll be. What do you remember about physics from the first half of the semester? Uh. Hmm. Yeah, I've read all this before, but. I can't recognize it. I, I wonder why I don't remember it. I think we better bring in some help. Hey, Long Term, what up? Sorry, who is this? Dude, this is Long Term Storage, the part of your brain where all the information that you've earned is stored for future use. I'm a person thankful for learning. Oh, cool, okay. Long Term Storage, what do you have for me? Let's see. I placed what gets in and what gets shut out. A couple of weeks ago, you were at your friend's house, and there was noisy construction going on right outside. But you were there for a while, and suddenly realized you didn't hear anymore. Well, that was me. I decided you had more important things to do with your friend than listen to that annoying sound, so I blocked it out. I am the gatekeeper who decides what goes into your memory and what doesn't get considered. You'd be surprised how much I rule the roost around here. Do you know that I have the power to shut down the sensory register and all the information in it all? On a good day, when you're feeling confident about yourself, I love to keep the blinds open. These are the days when you believe you can learn just about anything. Tests don't phase you when you're in this place either because you trust to know your stuff. However, I do have my dark days. The kids sitting next to you saw your grade and told everybody on the playground you were stupid. You knew the teacher thought you were totally hopeless too. It got worse. You went home and got grounded because of that test grade. And ever since then, whenever you walk into a science room, I shut down your Venetian blind. I am working on it. My new physics teacher is giving me new ways to learn and new opportunities. I'm opening that blind a bit. If you believe in yourself and others believe in you, I know you can get over that nasty habit of closing the blind. At your table, I'd like you to talk about the role of self-concept in learning. Like when you don't raise your hand, you're closing the blind because there's usually you don't know the answer or something happened in that class. But when the blinds open, you like like that class, and you will raise your hands. Are there classes where you feel the blinds are open? Are they open? And you math class. In math class. Social studies, science, language arts, literature class. Do you feel your like, blinds are closed for those? Some volunteers to share what really stuck for them from this video. Yeah. If you go into a class and it's like a class that you really get the concept of it and you're really understanding the class, then you would say if you looked at the clock just to check, it would seem like you just walked in the door, but it was like almost time to go. And you would really understand more of the class and you could recall more of that class. But then if it's closed that day or you don't like really understand something, and it would feel like the whole class was basically over, but then you'd look at the clock and it was only been like 15 minutes. So. As a teacher, it's great terminology for us, for me to think about to use with my students. Are your blinds open or closed? And um, these students here actually saw that video. Their science teacher showed it to them at the middle school at the beginning of the year. And I'd be interested to see when we go back to school, because we had seen it when we teach humanities. If we use that terminology, the students would connect to it and, and maybe let, you know, have their own self-realization. Self-concept, it's a lot like self-confidence. If you don't have a lot of self-confidence, then your blinds aren't going to be open for certain things. Good job. Okay, now I'd like you to take 30 seconds, roughly, very, to just think quietly to yourself. About a time that you shut your own blinds and you thought, I can't do this, so you automatically just shut off and you didn't let anything happen. We'll share afterwards, so just be quiet for now, please. Now 
I'd like you to share at your table. Maybe somebody who hasn't talked yet can speak up. Just to your, just amongst yourselves right now. My blinds just shut. I block out everything. Is there a connection to how the class is structured or something that happened in Spanish to you one time? It's a little bit about it. It's the structure and uh, so a time when I, like, I guess, closed my mind was um, I was trying to read, learn how to read sheet music. Is anybody comfortable sharing? When I was younger, I went to this hockey camp, and I had taken a couple years off from hockey, and I had just gotten back on, and I, <laughs> I was not very good. And the kids there would pick on me, and I didn't have any friends at the camp, and I would go home and cry. And now, I'm. I'm on a, I go to hockey practice every day, like, trying my best to keep my blinds open, and I like when the coaches, like, tell me that, like, tell me, like, to fix my mistakes when I make them, and, like, I have my friends on there, and some, like, sometimes I think in my mind that they're judging me, but they aren't, and it's just nice to kind of know that. So you felt like when you went home and you were upset that you were, your blinds were closed, and when you opened them, you kind of branched out a little? That's great. At my old school, uh, I didn't really, I wasn't that good with all the subjects, and everybody really, like, thought I wasn't that smart, and, like, they didn't think that I could do anything, so people kind of treated me really different from the other kids at our school, so my lines were closed for the whole year. This is a quote that we really like at Yats. Um, it's from Henry Ford, um, and it's, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And it's really just, like, explains, like, shows that if you have that expectation for yourself, you can do it, but if you don't, then it probably won't end up very good. The pins that are being passed out are pins that you can choose to incorporate if you wanted to take any part of this back. Um, I can give you a source where you can order them. We're going to give you a chance to evaluate your own learning strategies a little bit more. So in your curriculum packet on page uh, 34, you're going to see um, three smart learning tips. Okay, so once you've found that, I'd like you to identify one um, strategy that you use on this little craft organizer um, regularly. So one that you find helpful or um, that sort of thing. And one that maybe you could use um, in the future or one that um, you know is kind of difficult for you. I'm always texting friends during study sessions, like what do you do? I said it's not changing my friends and understanding what the teachers uh, say. Like, challenges is thinking so about. So do you want to further that? If you want to um, take those two, the difficulty for you and one strength um, of those out of all those learning tips, um, and write it down on a card and share it with the person next to you. <laughs> always like using it. So um, like a strategy that I use to like not use my phone is I like keep it halfway across my bedroom so if it goes off I really don't really want to get up and go get it. <laughs> um, so now we're just going to ask you guys if any of you guys want to share um, a challenge you have and a strategy you do. If a teacher is really confusing in a class you can uh go to them after school and or have them write down ideas on a piece of paper that you can study off of. When I'm getting ready for a test, I can get distracted really easily. And I'm a dancer, so I'm used to re um, repetition and rehearsal. So I, um, so when I'm getting ready for a test, I usually um, repeat some sentences for something or and just rehearse it and repeat it and repeat it. When I'm doing my schoolwork, I usually get distracted and think about what I'm going to do after school. And then to overcome that, I just ask for help so I can stay on task. If I have a test coming up or if I have a project due, and I'll put it off until like the last night or the weekend before. and. So I've been working on like spreading out the work 
before it's due, I'm trying to do a little bit every night instead of just all at once. So now we have um, a short children's book. It's called A Walk in the Rain with a Brain. Um, it's by Edward M. Hollowell. Um, and it's illustrated by Bill Mayer. And it's a really cute book. So especially for those of you who are in K-8 to schools, this is a potential activity where you could be a messenger to younger students around how the brain learns, and this book could be the way you do it. One wet day in May, when I went out to play, I heard near the ground a gurgling sound. What I thought was just rain was, of all things, a brain. It looked like a lump of cold smoke, but then it surprised me and spoke. I saw my friend Fred dive into his head, but he said one more time as he dipped out of sight, no brain is the same, no brain is the best. Each brain finds its own special way. In the back of that book actually are a number of activities and ways if you chose to go to a first, second grade with that, you could look at the activities that you felt best brought out the main point. Truth about the myth. Truth. All people can learn at high levels, regardless of race, gender, social class, parents, educational level, etc. The brain is like a muscle. The more you use it, the more it goes. The myth. In tiny letters. Some people are smart and some people are not, based on their gender, race, social class, parents, educational level, etc. Everybody want to take out their agenda. So it's starting at 1020, expectations, brain smart learning tips, the book, those three things. So okay, I'm going to ask one being you probably won't use it and five being you definitely will use it about the activity of the skit that we watched. Has anybody seen them? about the brain smart learning test. With the skit, my thought would be not that you would show that video, but if you wanted to do the skit yourselves, like at Hazen they actually had faculty be part of the skit, and I could try to find ways to get you the entire kit of props. It's a script for you to make your own. Um, if you chose to use it, any of these tools are for you to make your own. So. Um, just know that and give me a holler if it's something you wanted to do. For this next activity, I need you to find in your folder stereotypes and myths about learning. Hand up. For this activity, you're going to be writing down stereotypes and myths about either things you've heard about people in learning or things that you've thought yourself. And I'm going to walk you through it first by giving you a few examples up here. The first box on your, on your sheet says, Stereotypes teachers have of students relative to their learning potential. So for that, an example would be students whose parents went to college are smarter than students whose parents didn't go to college. So if you could write that, that could get you started in the first box. Stereotypes students have of other students relative to their learning potential. An example would be boys who are really focused on sports are not academically strong. In the third box, Stereotypes that influence my own perceptions of my abilities and potential. An example for that is, I'll never be as smart as my older sister. You can either write it in there or you can just reference it to the board if that will be helpful. So now, just so you know, anything you write on here for your own are not going to be seen by anybody else but you. So be totally honest, anything you think, no one's going to see them. So I'll give you a minute to just think of your own for each box. These are messages that we get through society that are not true but somehow they live in us. Again, I just pronounced that you pay attention for the hands up. Um, now what I'd like you to do if you are finished is rip them up. Rip them up into the tiniest pieces that you can. Because stereotyping is bad. They're not true. 
We set ourselves up judgmental sometimes, and when we physically see them on paper, if we physically get rid of those, it's really powerful. It is true that people of any gender, race, social class, and family educational experience, etc., are able to be successful learners. This fact is confirmed by current brain research that proves that we are all capable of learning at high levels of the work and market part. Our brain is just like a muscle that grows stronger and more capable with use. There are no smart and dumb people. There are just people whose um, brains are use their brains less and people who use their brains more. It is up to us to keep exercising our brains, and if we do, each one of us is as capable of <coughs> any other person of, of being a successful learner. Naming it and knowing it. When you realize your stereotyping, which is human nature, is nothing that you should feel ashamed about, it's way easier to get rid of something that you know is there. This is about us being self-aware and we can't not be in the world without stereotypes. We have them and sometimes we don't even, we're, we're not honest with ourselves that we have them. So this piece of being able to know them, um, not think they're going to disappear, but know them and let them go, shape them differently, that's, that's what our responsibility is. The first step is just realizing it's there in the first place. This poem, I think, is incredibly powerful to summarize a lot of what we've been talking about in the second part of the morning. When there are walls of ignorance between people, when we don't know each other's stories, we substitute our own myths about who that person is. When we are operating with only a myth, none of that person's truth will ever be known to us. And we will injure them, mostly without ever meaning to. So if you could please just take out your reflective sheet. This is the last what, so what, now what. And then we will move to what you're looking forward to. Even as leaders, sometimes, even like all of us, I know that I have, like sometimes we all like judge someone even if it's in your head. We can't all act like we don't do it, but we can at least like try to make it better with like, everyone about adding to the list stereotypes that students have of teachers oh. as well. Oh. That's a great idea. Mm. Okay, I'm going to ask again for the one to five shredding stereotypes activity. Raise them high, raise them high. <laughs> Everybody want to circle up? What you're going to do is um, point your finger like this with your right hand and then put your palm out like this with your left. And then it's you're gonna have to kind of line up with the people next to you. So put your finger over the person's palm and then put your palm on, on three and only on three, not before or after. Try to avoid your avoid your finger being grabbed while grabbing the person's finger. What? Somebody start counting. Wait, no, no, this is wrong. I tried to grab your hand. <laughs>
we're going to pour out in a little bit about this, um, just to a person next to you, but you might want to just have in mind to, um, to keep an open mind and not judge anybody and just say, because this can be kind of personal, you know, um, just where you are as a learner, you don't want to seem um, dumb or anything, but, um, so I'll just give you a minute to kind of figure out where you think you are on this, where you, um, are you more of kind of a growth mindset? Are you more of a fixed mindset? And how can you work towards having more growth mindset? There's no question that I live in fixed, maybe more often than I wish. And, and we're, we're just about choices. So please do not feel like there's judgment. It's all about the journey. And the more we understand it and can name it, and then we can control it, the better. In your folders on the right side, towards the back, you'll find a little cartoon. So there's a situation, and then there's the, fix, the thoughts of a fixed mindset person and the thoughts of a growth mindset person. So the situation for this example is, it is time to sign up for courses for next semester. The guidance counselor tells you that she thinks you are very capable of taking a challenging science class. You really like science. Your immediate thought is, now I'd like to ask someone to read the fixed mindset for me. Even though I like science, and this might be a great class, I really think I might not do as well as if I took a more basic class. I know my friends who took that class last year and worked really hard. So hard it made me wonder how smart they were if they took that much to do well. And sometimes they worked really hard and didn't get a great grade. I think I'm going to get st to yeah, I'm going to stick with the easier class and do really well. It would be too embarrassing to not do. Thank you. Anybody else like to read for the growth mindset? <clears throat> if I am psyched to take on this science class. It will be really challenging for me. I would probably have to work harder than I ever have, but I learned so much. I know others who took it, and even though they worked hard, they didn't get the greatest grades. That doesn't really matter. I'm glad to just keep learning from my mistakes and exploring a subject I enjoy. I'm sure the teacher will help me when I get stuck and just can't figure it out. Thank you. So although they seem a little corny, they are true. And... So now when you turn back to the side with the blank ones, and you can do situation one, if you understand how to do it, and you fill it out yourself. You fill out what you would believe after reading the situation would be the thoughts of a fixed mindset person, and then the thoughts of a growth mindset. Does anybody have any questions? If I get his help, then it will just make me look dumb. Yes, yeah, so you can see how being a fixed mindset does not benefit to me, even though I'm kind of like more fixed myself. Okay, now I'm going to ask for an example of the fixed mindset. I'm stupid. I should have, I should have gotten that question right. How about a growth mindset? This is a learning experience. I'll go get his help and I'll do better and try again. Sometimes, because schools penalize us when we take risks, like they, it can feel that way with grading or certain processes. Um, that sometimes it's not our mindset, it's the situation, and that this is a way that you can potentially go to faculty and say, can there be a space where we can rewrite or redo an assignment or retake a test because we will learn better through the process of failure, what, what might be termed failure, we'll take more risks, um, and, and that could be a way that you could really start a, a shift in, your, in the thinking and doing that allows you as students to move more to growth than staying fixed and, and not risk because there's too many, um, it, it's too, too scary or, or too lost latent for you um, to choose to do that. A fixed mindset doesn't necessarily mean a bad mindset, because I personally feel like most of the time that's my perspective on things, that I have a fixed mindset of it's all about the grade and getting good grades, it's not about how can I learn from this. So don't feel like if you think you're a fixed mindset that it's critical to move to a growth because it's, it happens, it's where you are, and then just realize that there are other opportunities and ways to learn. So now we're going to watch a movie, or like a short video, not really a movie, but yes. Um, but while you're watching this, we want you guys to think about like what is a mindset, um, why do they matter, and how can you change them. What do you think is the key to achieving our goals, our success? Some people suggest things like hard work, 
focus, persistence. But research shows these are all byproducts of something else, something much more powerful that we can all develop. It is this very special something that really is critical to success and is what I'm here to discuss with you today. Someone who has achieved great success is Josh Waitzkin, a chess international master and the subject of the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. Nobody has won all the national chess championships that Josh has. But even more impressive, when he turned 21, he took on the challenge of mastering something completely new and very different from chess, martial arts. He realized that he had learned how to grow and succeed, and he could apply that understanding to other domains. And so he devoted himself relentlessly to Tai Chi Chuan. And after lots of hard work, many failures, and some broken joints, he became a great martial artist, and he won two world championships. Now he's off to jiu-jitsu. So what does Josh say is the greatest thing that ever happened to him? Believe it or not, he says, losing my first national chess championship because it helped me avoid many of the psychological traps. The key trap that Josh avoided was believing that he was special, that he was smarter than other people and that he didn't have to work hard. He could have thought of himself as a prodigy, but he doesn't think that he has extraordinary intelligence. He says, the moment we believe that success is determined by an ingrained level of ability, we will be brittle in the face of adversity. Josh often quotes Stanford professor Carol Dweck, who discovered that some people see intelligence or abilities as fixed, what is called a fixed mindset, while other people see them, as Josh does, as qualities that can be developed, a growth mindset. More important, Dr. Dweck discovered that these two different mindsets lead to very different behaviors and results. In a study she did with Dr. Lisa Blackwell, Several hundred seventh graders were surveyed to determine which mindset each student had, and then they were tracked for two years. Results showed that the students with a growth mindset, those who thought they could change their own intelligence, increased their grades over time, while those with a fixed mindset did not. You can see the trend. The gap in performance just widens and widens over time. The difference between these two groups? A different perspective on intelligence. Other studies have shown similar. So if you could just talk for a minute at your table about what pieces, he brought a lot of things that we've been talking about together in a package. What was most distinctive about his summary of this? Did it pull anything together for you? About two minutes to do that. He was um, making people aware that like how they can act and how like if you have a, a, a fixed mindset how it can like affect you if you want to have like more of a positive attitude then you that's like more of a goal do you know this one of the reasons why video games are so popular with boys because it allows them to take risks and fail often very privately does anybody want to share what you guys discussed Schools, they, 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 like, they focus on fixed mindsets and not growth mindsets and that's why you're thinking about like you know how a lot of kids have fixed mindsets it's all about the grade and not about the process yeah. I wonder he thought oh we're doing so great we've moved away from 80% or A's or B's and we're just really focusing on being proficient or not proficient with the skill and that there's room for growth but we know that students still see to three four as a measurement <laughs> and how how do I help give feedback to the students and the other teachers and the parents and still promote a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. and the people in the um, fixed mindset, they were told that they were really smart with this and that they did really good and they probably just didn't even have to try. So they wanted to keep that praise. So they lied about what they actually got, even though they got a much lower score. So could you guys just pull out your pink sheets and fill out um, the mindset choices matching game, the cartoon, and the video? Mm -hmm. I just again get the one through five on if you want to do these. Um, starting with the mindset matching activity. Raise your eyes, see all your hands. Okay, how about the 
cartoon activity. To give you time to process this a little bit, we're going to have a short break again. Just walk up, I mean, just stand up, stretch a little bit, talk to somebody, whatever, and then we're going to go and finish this up. Okay. In your packet is this blue sheet. We didn't do it today. It's the right-hand side. And don't go to it now, please. But it's, it's actually Eduardo, um, the guy who is in the video. It's his organization, and Derek Carroll Dweck, the woman who created this whole thing. Um, it's a self-assessment, so you can actually use this. And, you, and we've used it at Hazen, they used it with their peers to self-assess by a scale that they have developed and is pretty well constructed. It's a little hard in the scoring, so make sure if you use it with others, you've gone through the scoring thing, and you can help pace people through it. Otherwise. It can take a lot of time and get frustrating and then you lose people. Okay, so on your tables you'll find a sheet that's rather uh, long. It's called color. You use some pieces of paper on it. That's it looks like it. Um, on one side you will see um, a little section called Notes to Myself. At a conference uh, about a year and a half ago, we had about 150 people there, um, youth and adults. And they were asked to start to record what is it they need from, from different people in their lives, from themselves and the other main players in their lives, to maintain healthy, high expectations. So from the words of Vermont young people, this was created and starts with what I can ask of myself and then goes to what classmates can do and then uh, parents, teachers, and community members on the back. So I think that the fun part of this is it came from within. We also have this as a blank template so that if you wanted to do, instead of taking this, you wanted to create this in your school as a way to really think about these concepts, it's blank and then you can write in yours and share them as a community. So that's, um, that's an option. Okay, so look on that on that notes to myself section, and um, for yourself, try to pick a challenge that you have and um, a strength that you have. Okay, and if you're comfortable after you have um, kind of identified it, figured this out for yourself, just do it with your chair. Talk to the person next to you, like we've been doing all day. I am willing to rework something until I get it right, because it has to do with gymnastics. And so I do that a lot. And like when I don't have a skill, I still try and do it. Like I don't give up, and I just do it. Helen passed out these, if I believe you can see them on your table. This is another um, quote that we have. We're kind of goal oriented at the Yes program. This one is actually from Christopher Robin to Promise me you always remember, you're braver than you believe, and stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. So, um, we were just wondering, you know, is that something that you guys would use in as a quote that you might bring into your book? For instance, if you read the children's book, you could then pass it out with the, the second graders, or you could pass it to peers, just you could, I don't know what you could do with them. Um, we don't know if, you know, we just give you tools, and you figure out what fits for you. Um, but we're curious if this one feels like it could work for you in any way. Should we put it out there? Should we wrap it into the next version of the curriculum or, or not? So talk at your table and see what you think about it. Just a couple thoughts about whether you would use that card and in what situation. Yeah, like sometimes you think wrong about yourself and reading this, it like makes you think further back and think about what you can achieve and what you can do and all that, and yeah. So my history teacher, he, he's my homeroom, he makes that, like he doesn't make us, but he has us do this project where we put our name and then we put a quote that like motivates us, and this could be a motivating quote to someone else. That's great. Yeah. If you come up as a team with some new and different things, Please share it back, and we'll include it in the next packet for the next folks. This is this comes from everybody. Why don't we just end with this um, poem that is in your packet? This is by E. E. Cummings. Um, we do not believe in ourselves until someone reveals that deep inside us, 
something is valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our touch, sacred to our touch. Once we believe in ourselves, we can risk curiosity, wonder, spontaneous delight, or any experience that reveals the human spirit. So pepper your schools with whatever poem suits your fancy, but, but I think um, there's a lot in there to, to really wrap around what we've been talking about today. So thank you. In the packet, it's your planning guide. So this is just a planning sheet to draw the next 15, 20 minutes that you have as a team. Think about, do we want to go to peers? Do we want to go to faculty? Do we want to go to parents and community? You don't have to do all at once. Um, you, you don't have to do every single group. You could choose to just focus on one or two because for your school and your group, that's what you think would be best use of your time. So be thinking about which group and then in what setting, faculty meeting, student community meeting, I don't know what it is, but you do. And then what message? Do you want mindset? Do you want... Um, Stereotyping, which of the activities for you do you want to hold on to and bring up? That's your task. Wicked, pull out that last ounce of focus for the last 15, 20 minutes so that when you go home, you're on the ground running. So we have posters for you to take home and you will be mailed a check that is of your discretion what to do. Maybe you need pizza to get people to your meeting. Can you share with us a little bit your journey towards becoming a facilitator, how you started facilitating with YATS, and maybe share a little bit about the preparation that it took to be able to do this today. You've all done an amazing job. It really, it really does take a lot of my energy, and a lot of my time is devoted to this. Um, yeah, so like I was up hours last night um, till like 11, 12 last night and really pounding this out and figuring out what I was going to say. I mean, I was um, in the bathroom this morning just talking to the mirror. I got into it like doing the facilitating as my guidance counselor asked me. Um, she came up to me and she asked me if I would do it. And I just, I was really nervous at first, but now that I've done it. I liked it. It was a good experience. experience. Do. Just have that mindset that there's everything's gonna be okay, and that like the practice is there. You're gonna practice. You're gonna be ready. Like you don't need to be nervous. And obviously, the nerves are there. I was nervous. I'm nervous right now. <laughs> but just preparation is key. Just prepare yourself and have take risks. Don't be afraid.